Hi, y'all. We're ex uh, excited to have you here and want to welcome you to Flatiron School's Cybersecurity Essentials Intro to Malware Analysis. My name is Corey Nicholson, and I'm the Marketing Events Coordinator here with Flatiron School. A big part of my job is hosting free introductory workshops like this to give you all the opportunity to meet some of our instructors and get a better feel of the Flatiron School experience. Uh, I also host another um, program called Tech in 20, where we take 20 minutes to discuss hot topics within the tech industry. So a quick reminder, we're gonna be using the chat as the main source of communication. Don't worry about raising your hand or doing anything like that. If you have a question, just go ahead and ask directly. Uh, if you wanna keep it private, you're more than welcome to just send it to host and panelist. Uh, but if you wanna chat with everybody, make sure that that little blue button goes from host and panelist to everyone. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our host for the evening. Uh, this is Ian Harrison. He is one of our lead cyber security instructors. Take it away, Ian. Thank you. <clears throat> And I am not nervous at all to be here in front of all of you today. So I am totally relaxed, but I hope everyone is equally uh, relaxed and feels good and is excited to talk about some of this. <clears throat> Again, my name's Ian. Um, I've been here with Flatiron for a little under a year, I think. I'm not totally sure at this point. Um, but I'm a cybersecurity instructor. Uh, we teach a lot of cool stuff. Um, I came from Western Governors University for a bachelor's and my master's. Um, I also have a handful of certs from CompTIA, uh, topped it all off with a certified ethical hacker, which is also through school, and I'm hoping to share at least a little bit of that with you today. So let's go ahead and get started. And again, any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. I'll answer them the best I can. Um, but let's go ahead and get moving. So core concepts for today is you know what are we protecting against like what is malware what malware is there today right um this changes pretty often um and there's also some funny stuff you're going to see through here where it seems like over time some things change drastically but other things don't change at all um but you know again we'll, we'll see some more of those data points uh moving forward uh next we're going to move into a closer look at malware really the different types of malware analysis, some of the tools you would want to use, and some of the things you could expect to see, uh, and most of all, how to stay safe while doing this. It's incredibly important. You think, uh, you know, <laughs> am I just going to download this malware and look at it and on my home computer? Like, that doesn't really sound too smart if you ask really anybody. Um, so we're going to look at that. And then, of course, what do you do with that information? We've torn a, a piece of malware all the way apart down to the core. We see all these strings. We know kind of what it does, but like, then what do you do? You know, why did we do all this? Why do we use all these man hours and all this knowledge and all this time and money and effort to solve it? And that's for prevention and mitigation, right? Because I, I hope we're all white hats here. I hope there are no gray to black hat hackers hanging out. Um, if you are, I'm going to say I'm watching you anyway. So, Right, so that should be the takeaway is, you know, how we make ourselves secure, how we protect against it, um, and the like. So let's uh, go into stage one here. Malware today, where do you look? You know, you can ask your friend, you can ask me, you can ask your instructors, but, you know, at, at some point you need to just have some good industry resources, right? Um, yeah. OWASP top 10. I'm going to say that this is probably one of the best things for you to look at. Um, you know, it gives you a constant running thing. Every few years they do an update. It looks like this last one was a four year iteration. Um, and I can, we're gonna look at that for a little bit today and talk about the data points I was just mentioning. So you see some things have changed greatly. Some things haven't changed at all. For example, server side request forgery. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that, especially if you've been in the field for a little while because I'm, I've definitely read about this probably 15 plus years ago. Um, and last uh, 2017, four years ago, this wasn't even on the list. And now it's showing up in our top 10. So you see, you know, as things go by, you know, if you don't learn from your past, you're, you're bound to repeat it, right? So it's sometimes a matter of making little modifications and standard configurations that suddenly open up a vulnerability that's been closed for 20 years, right? Um, so it's good to have these resources, not assume things are solved, not assume somebody else is handling it, right? And this is one of the top sources. You know, additionally, if you're not a practitioner, there's other stuff for you to look at, particularly the ISC squared cyber defense report. Um, you know, this is a more international view, um, source countries where it's coming from, uh, types of attacks, the industry of uh, th that the attacks are on, and the percentage uh, of how many organizations in that industry experience it. Great information here. 
Um, so anyone in the field, anyone in security, which I believe security falls to everyone to some extent. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit more moving forward, but this is a good read. This is definitely good points of information for everyone in any organization. Now, let's skip though. So we'll build a scenario here. We're, we're in an organization and, uh, you know, Nancy calls and says that she has something that's suddenly on her desktop and she doesn't know what it is and we need to look at it and figure out what it is. What, what's your first step? Does anybody have any thoughts of what a first step would be? If you think you have malware, if you see a file, something.txt, something.py, what do you think that you would do? Does anybody have a suggestion? Isolate. That's a good thought. Yeah, no, Sherry, that's a great idea. So, you know, so this is where we would go into a first stage of malware analysis, right? So we're going to call this shutdown PC Turner Lanceware. <laughs> Thank you, John. I appreciate your user training has come in effectiveness or full effectiveness. And that's something I cover here as well. Um, but I would say the first thing that you're going to do, and a lot of people say, is you do a virus total upload. So Virus Total is a beautiful little site that has, you know, probably 50 plus different antivirus suites on the other side of it, that if you have suspect software files, packages, anything like that, you upload them to this portal, they do this full scan for known signatures, which, you know, is here on our core concepts, um, you know, sometimes there's just going to be certain strings, certain functions, method or module calls, um, IP address association even, um, that can be seen in these files in certain ways and instantly flags as a known signature. And again, rather than having 54 or 57, forget which actual total of uh, different AV suites that are behind virus total, um, along with custom scripting and uh, different heuristic analyses, um, rather than having those all installed locally or even in your network somewhere, um, this is a really good one-stop shop to dump that. Um, and I hate to give anybody a single resource for something like this. Microsoft WDSI is a very similar one. Coming from Microsoft, you could expect that a lot of that would be geared more toward looking at Windows-based exploits and vulnerabilities. Um, but nonetheless, there's a, a lot of overlapping things like, I mean, network-based uh, exploits. And uh, it just different protocols that are across the board that we all use. Um, you know, LDAP is something that goes across to both, right? So. That's a good start there. Now, not everything is going to be able to be seen right up front. And that's where we go into the next step, which is disassembly and extraction. Um, the, you know, the primary tool that you're going to hear from this, it, whether you look up videos on YouTube, you're Googling something, or you go to an instructor and ask them, you're going to be told Ghidra. Ghidra is pretty much the go-to tool for this. A um, lot of very cool things to, to the point where Ghidra even has a virus total plugin that as you're analyzing this software and pulling it apart and finding all the lines and putting them in order and looking at them this way, um, it's also running the file against all the antiviruses for you. Um, so granted, you might be able to skip a step, but you know, on a on a workflow point, you know, if you're actually the the technician that is solving this, you don't necessarily want to spend hours and days looking into it and just figuring out what you can find out about this file. If you throw it into virus total and it says that there's a compromise or known signatures, you simply delete that and you get on with it. Um, or, you know, Sherry is saying with isolation, you could do that for for um, you know, if you want to know where that's coming from, if that's an, a persistent threat in some way, that's something that your wider security team would start looking at. Um, but initial triage maybe. Um, even less than isolation, just pulling it off the network, right? Um, shutting down PC, turn over land, good ideas, all good stuff. Um, but again, so this is static analysis. And again, you're not running code for static analysis. Nothing is live. You're not pulling the trigger to the weapon. You have a file and you're doing everything you can to not double click it and run it. You are reverse engineering it. You know, imagine when. Ford was stealing Mercedes back in the 60s and reverse engineering their cars so they could build their cars in similar ways. And that's documented. That's something you could all look up as well. But static analysis isn't always good enough anyway. Sometimes it's overly encrypted. Sometimes you really just can't pull viable information out of these files. Polymorphic viruses, for example, you know, they're not going to get hit with known signatures. Um, you know, a common method as well. Uh, for obfuscation 
which would lead to us needing to go to the next step, which I'll go ahead and skip to is dynamic analysis. Um, yeah, I actually lost my train of thought there because I started reading my dynamic analysis, but let's keep going. Dynamic analysis, something else is going on. We can't see it. It's there's something wrong with this file. I didn't put it here. I can't tell where it came from. I can't disassemble it. And I know for sure that this is scary. So what are we going to do? We're going to install the virtualization. This is where isolation comes in. Um, so virtualization sandboxing, that's number one. If you're going to run a known or even questionably malicious piece of software, you absolutely do not want to be putting that on anything that you care about. You do not want to run it on your host machine. And this is where virtualization is going to come in. Um, if you're not familiar with virtualization, VirtualBox, nice, easy, free software, good GUI interface to use. You could use Linux as the operating system, which is another free download on the internet. And you can have a totally contained environment with another operating system to put this file on and run and see what's going to happen. That's sandboxing. You're using vir virtualization to sandbox it to look at what's happening. Um, you know, I mentioned Docker here as well, uh, which I'll come to that in a second for the virtualization. That's more or less for version control, I would say. Um, right, so you're watching it, um, but what do you what do you look at while it's running? Um, you know, if does anybody have a, even a suggestion of what your computer would do differently if it suddenly has malware running on it? What do you look for? Are there sig like, nothing's being caught? You don't have an antivirus throw up. Um, I mean, what are some of the things that you could expect that would make you say, I wonder if my computer's starting to do this, run slower? Yeah, no, that's a good one. So yeah, that's if it's running slower, if it's lagging at all, you start going into process monitoring, right? And so that's really what you're going to be doing. You're just going to be watching the machine in general. Locks up, mouse starts moving by itself. Yeah, so that's going to be probably more of a remote access Trojan, John. Um, you know, somebody's doing some kind of remote control of your machine. And yeah, so that would be an outcome for sure. Um, but more or less, the malware is what we're is the catalyst for that, right? It's what causes it, allows you to do something. Yeah, good dams, pop ups, and so that's you know network based. You know, so you're all looking at different things, and these are all signatures, right? Um, so what you're going to use your you could use integrated tools, right? So if you know grandma calls you and you're her tech guy, you're, you're her 15 year old tech guy like I was, um, and her computer starts acting slow. Perfect example there, Vanessa. Um, what did I do before I even had that knowledge of, you know, an actual uh, uh, like penetration tester, like I would, um, some of the experience I have now, um, you know, I would just start looking at the task manager. Does that make sense to anybody? You know, just start looking at what's in like included on your computer to just monitor it. Because if you can't see what's going on in the code through static, if it's obfuscated to the point where you can't read the text in it, the only real way to look at it is to observe what it does in the wild. So, um, you know, let's go back to run slower performance monitoring. Let's look at your CPU cycles. Let's pull up your task manager. Look at what what actual processes are running. Um, for example, that um, if there's string extraction in the in the prior steps and static analysis work, you would see a lot of system calls. You would see it trying to access memory. You would see it uh, trying to access the internet. You, you, again, you might see IP addresses. Um, so you can start getting a source of where this is, what, you know, where it's coming from where it would be going to, um, is data being exfiltrated? Like you can start finding this stuff out. Um, but unfortunately these integrated OS tools aren't always gonna be enough, right? You might still have to get some other things. Does anybody have any other, uh, let's expand our tool set. Um, you know, if I'm looking at process or, or uh, task manager in Windows and I'm not seeing enough, uh, we're gonna have to step that up and use some third-party software. Does anybody have any uh, suggestions on those? Anybody know what those were? That's going to make sense at all. So. Yeah, so John's, uh, John's talking about this if you don't see that. Um, you know, the attack vector, right? So, um, I, yeah, I guess for dynamic analysis, it wouldn't necessarily um, be something we would be able to decipher, right? Um, that's, that's, I feel like a triage. You know, that's a first step. Uh, you know, what, what happened? Did somebody come in here? Um, I talked about Sally at the front desk letting uh, an imposter in, right? Uh, everybody's responsible for, uh, for security at some level. Um, but, uh, but either way, so we're getting a little off, I'm getting a little off track. I'm going to dial it back. Um, so, right, task manager makes sense. Stepping that up, there are third-party softwares like uh, Procmon, Process Monitor, does a lot more in-depth looking. Um, so uh, I've 
uh, networking. So you're talking about pop-ups. We can see where pop-ups will be coming from. So the malware comes in, something happens, and you open up your door to something on the outside. Those might just be pop-ups, but now we have an IP address that the pop-ups are coming from, right? Um, so if we need to investigate network-based ill will somehow, we have another tool to use. Anybody have a suggestion for that one? I'm gonna spoil it because I don't wanna wait. It's Wireshark. So I could watch all day to in NetStat, which is an included integrated OS tool to see what's coming and going from my operating system. I can see what ports are um, translating to or transmitting to what IP addresses, all that good stuff. But I can't really document it over time and see what's happening well. Um, and so don't reinvent the wheel. Don't try to write logs and get stuff to write out to it and work your Python magic. This is important. You're doing an analysis for something that's on your network, right? So let's just get Wireshark going, capture it, run, like get into virtualization, start running something, capture all the packets that come through, kill it, and then export that PCAP file. And then you can start with another step of static analysis on a static file that you've pulled from the behavior of this. Uh, dynamic analysis that we were running, right? Um, so we've talked about a lot of these concepts. We've seen a lot of the, or talked about a lot of tools. It's just, I wanna kind of show you guys some stuff that you can get into to start doing some basic malware analysis. Because again, I could talk to you all day about, uh, for, uh, Corey and I, for example, we were just talking about this C file that I have in Fedora here, which is used from our curriculum to leverage a buffer overflow attack on yourself. Um, so, you know, assuming some of you aren't in Flatter, and I see a couple of familiar names, so I know some of you are already here, but, you know, if some of you are entertaining the idea of joining Flatiron, um, here's something that you'll actually be able to look at and play with, and some of the stuff you'll be able to do when you leave, right? So this is a simple little 20 line um, C file um, that came right out of our curriculum. That is the introduction to a buffer overflow, as I was mentioning just before. So... Generally speaking, I'm not going to go over all of it, um, but we have a couple of 21 expected bit variables, um, and it just asks for inputs and, give you, and gives you an output. So we're going to run that. I'm going to show you what this looks like and how quickly something can become way wrong. Um, so here we go. So let's run this file with C. And again, this is, this is just fun facts for anybody. Um, You'll see I'm modifying the buffer.c file, but I'm running the buffer.elf file. And that is because C is a compiled language and it creates these elf files out of the C code. So, you know, difference between source and binaries, all that good stuff. So um, we're going to run this. It's not a robust program. It doesn't ask me for anything, but some of you might see in the future, um, this is expecting a text input. So I'm just going to give it my name. Uh, I'm going to say I'm Ian Harrison. And so if the program was a game, I would have lost because it expected this chain of numbers to come out. Um, so, you know, at this stage, if I was developing an application where I say security falls to everyone, this is where I would start security testing to see if this application would handle as expectedly if I did all kinds of crazy stuff to it or something we would call fuzz testing. Um, and again, there's other programs that can do fuzz testing and give it immense levels of input. Um, but we can do this one. I can get it to manipulate with my hand. So let's just keep watching here. So I'm going to rerun this one. And I'm going to type my name a few more times. But I'm going to try to max out these character links that we looked at before. Anybody remember what the number was? 21, right? So two variables, 21 lengths. That's 42. Let's see how many characters we get in here. All right. Okay, I broke it. Let's do it. So, so what's going on here? Does anybody have any idea of what might be happening with the code here? I'm getting crickets, buffer overflow. Well, yeah, it, it's, it is a buffer overflow, but we're not really exploiting it yet, right? So like we're not, I'm not allowing it to the pointer more or less to point to another location and start running erroneous commands. But again, this is exactly how you would do that. And you're right. It's too many characters. It's larger than the expected buffer size. Um, and it starts overflowing. Um, so 
the process or you know the system has to have a way to handle that and in c specifically in memory it has these pointers that says okay i ran out of memory space look here instead and this is in this case it continues to the other variable um so again this is how you could get this to exploit or you could exploit this tiny little bit of code to just run erroneous data or send it to a different location of memory um with just a very few steps and again i can't go all the way through that today I mean, not only is there a time constraint, but there's a lot of other resources that I have to get going here. Um, but so this is really simple stuff. You could just download this online, you know, look up a buffer overflow script and get it, and you can actually start playing with it and seeing where things start happening. Um, and again, you know, I can't remember if I said this to you all or in a practice of this presentation, but uh, you know, the difference between malware and totally normally functioning software is really quite possibly just intent. Um, so let's continue looking at other forms of malware though. Um, so let's back off of here, some good resources. I do, I have some resources in a list at the end of the presentation. I'm gonna talk about those a little bit too. And here's a really cool one. So this, and a lot of you might not recognize some of these words. I'm gonna to try to find some that maybe everybody might. Um, ransomware, here we go, this is a good one. So this is an entire folder full of malware binaries that I have found in a wonderful little tool called the zoo. Um, theoretically, um, and if you want to work with the logic here, a zoo, you know, you come in, you look at all the animals that would otherwise kill you or eat you in these beautiful glass boxes, and you could admire their beauty. Um, so that's effectively what we're doing here with malware. Um, so zoo brings in all of the animals from Noah's Ark, in this case, it is all these exploits and known malicious software, Friday the 13th exploit. Um, Michelangelo, I haven't actually heard of that one, a few Linux specific, and you see they're um, you know, ordered with Linux dot, so you kind of have a little, little bit of platform. Um, and this is really easy to get. I, you don't even have to install and run the Zoo software. All of the binaries just come right out of a zip file you can pull down off of uh, SourceForge and GitHub. Um, so, where am I yeah, with this one? That's a little bit of an insight onto what it looks like on a terminal, right? I can say, oh, you get strings. And these are some of the strings that you are going to see when you disassemble code. You're going to see provided input because this is plain strings. You're going to see uh, commands. Uh, you know, you're going to see, uh, like I said, IP addresses. You're going to see any includes. You're, all these packages, this stuff will come up when you disassemble this stuff. Um, and it'll print out line by line and you can just read through for anything that looks like it could be suspect. Um, yeah, you saw WannaCry, there's a couple versions of it actually. Um, there's Enhanced, I think might be the second one. Uh, but WannaCry and WannaCry Plus, there we go, yeah. Um, and yeah, I keep naming after villains, there's a Thanos one, um, Cerberus. A lot of cool stuff. Friday the 13th. And again, all the stuff that's going to do negative, you know, bad things to you or your computer um, seems to be <laughs> a, a naming convention, right? Um, but in, in Android, see, yeah, I mean, so this is cross platform as well. You got anywhere from mobile all the way up to your servers, right? Um, so this is a great resource for anyone who just wants to familiarize themselves with, again, what's in the field now. Um, this is all known. This is stuff that's been patched against and plenty of uh, platforms. Um, but it's still, again, like we said, with the initial reference to um, old problems dying hard, um, you know, if you don't learn from your mistakes, you're going to keep repeating them, right? Um, so moving on a little bit is like, you know, some of what we can do with it. Um, you know, why, why do we do that? Why do we put ourselves through all of this trouble? And it's really for prevention. And, and again, I say, like, I really hope I have white hats here. I hope I'm not pointing people who are like, you know what, I want to steal from all of my local banks really bad. And I'm like, oh, here's an entire suite of bad software for you to do something with. But I hope everybody here has an interest in preventing this, right? I hope everybody wants to learn about it so they can really just make the world a better place, right? Um, but so this is what we do with that. You know, so that, all that discussion to say this is how it actually plays out into being a more secure environment. Um, and it's, you know, education is paramount. I, I think education is always going to be the number one prevention thing. Um, you know, 
insider threats are the number one issue that a threat vector that happens to any organization, whether that's a disgruntled employee that gets mad, you know, to, uh, right? Right? Somebody, nobody has taken down any of the things that I am upset about, right? I mean, it's, it's almost like all of the hackers are on the other side. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Richards, I apologize. I don't know the abbreviation for SC there. Um, yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, sounds like a lot of people here have student loans. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, you know, end user training, like I was mentioning, your end users are, you know, Karen at the front desk who the, the cable guy walks up and he has to do some kind of Wi-Fi survey and she just lets him, okay, yep, whatever. And then he's the guy who plugged in the USB. Right, yeah. And then he's the guy who goes in, plugs in the USB. Gosh, now I'm getting depressed. Everybody's talking about <laughs> all their uh, student loans <laughs> and all the good things that aren't happening to them. Um, but right, so, uh, you know, Karen lets it in. How does Karen even know that she's doing something wrong? And that's user training. Right. If she gets an email and it says, hey, you know, check this, this invoice doesn't look right. Um, you know, it looks like you might have put the wrong date. And she clicks on this and it runs a macro in Excel because she clicks enable because she thinks it's from her boss. This is very quick. It just it spirals right out of control. And until you can see that something's happening and start doing this analysis and see where it's coming from and really cut the initial part off. You, you don't learn from it, you don't fix something, right? You're, you're, not, you're not making that forward progress, whether as a company or as an individual. Um, you know, for technicians, people who do know a lot about this, somebody like myself who, you know, I, I passed a CEH two years ago, and to be honest with it, I haven't talked a lot about malware analysis since then. So, you know, and you come into a new job, right? Our macros virus is Again, so Kevin, right, that's exactly what I'm talking about is it should be nullified and they're not run by default. So when you, you know, for example, if I sent you a Word document or if I sent you even just like the slideshow at the end of this, right? Um, and you opened it up in uh, whether, uh, what is it? Uh, PowerPoint, that's right. If you open up PowerPoint, it's gonna suggest uh, that a lot of things are disabled. Um, so it's gonna say like, you know, do you wanna enable editing? That's one thing. And then there's also like content disabling, which is, Really, it's it's just a click, click, it's done. You're enabled. Um, so right, it is nullified, it is prevented, it is mitigated. And all it takes is saying yes to unmitigate that. Um, and so, you know, that's where I would say social engineering, right? Social engineering is where a lot of the bad things are gonna happen because it's just what lets it circumvent your safeguards, right? Um, so, you know, whether that is the, the USB, that just walked in the front door and he plugged in because he thought it was, he made it look like it was his job or you know that's something coming in on network that somebody had to click on a phishing email and it's way more high tech right um there's still the possibility for that to come through and in another thing let me let me caveat that again by saying everything that i just showed you in you know our vm here theoretically has some kind of mitigation in place for it um you know you want to think back uh, you know initially right now what's the most present uh, zero day exploit that anybody can think of. That's happened most recently. Does anybody know the, the recent one with Apache? Log4j, there we are, you are a guy. I'm glad you're here. And uh, you know, if anybody was around for a little bit before that would have seen uh, like Heartbleed, which is you know, a major SSL vulnerability. Apache and SSL, we just touched both of those. And you'll see, so the Apache issue with Log4j, that was a pretty easy patch. I don't know if you were in a system administrative position um, at that point, yeah, open source middleware. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that there, John, uh, uh, with the open source middleware, if you want to uh, add on to that. But um, to continue though with Kevin, right? So log4j, simple patch, you just put it in there. It's a tiny little configuration modification. And there's no, you know, there's no single tread road for software. You know, there's no one algorithm or logic string that's going to accomplish um, you know, whatever objective that you're trying to accomplish with, uh, you know, any given piece of software. So, you know, I'm saying that it's just a complex environment to where super common issues constantly re-rear their heads. Um, and I, you know, with this buffer overflow, let's discuss that for a moment as well. Um, so we can say that buffer overflows are pretty old news, right? I mean, this has been happening since they were programming on punch cards. Um, but at the end of the day, this is this almost one of the, I mean, I'd say what top five, I would have to actually look back to all of the documentation, but one of the 
main vectors, right? Many companies don't take time to develop software. That's not really issues. Open source models keep time and log files. Exactly. Right. So, you know, we we're talking about Splunk earlier. Um, uh, Damseth mentioned it. Um, right. I mean, you can, it's a matter of saving time, right? So you're doing your due diligence, you're checking off all the boxes. And I feel like that's a little bit of a different discussion, right? To where it's like, why do people even invest in cybersecurity? And really, I think that's regulation, right? It's they don't want to get burned with fines. That's the only reason they're doing it. They're not doing it to protect your data. It's their, it's their company, it's not their data. Um, so, you know, there's that's that's a caveat for sure. But, um, right. And again, so, but to say buffer overflow, um, and, and I'll expand on that even, you know, I'm saying buffer overflow. A buffer is not just memory, right? Um, you know, a buffer stack overflow would be like a memory overflow is what we're talking about here. Um, but, uh, you know, you can also overflow all kinds of different other protocols that have that buffer linked in them. Uh, for instance, anybody recall the ping of death, uh, which was, I mean, you can send a single ping packet that would crush a whole web server. Um, and it, uh, another example of this uh, Linux fork bomb, is anybody familiar with those? Um, you know, it's literally just a string of special characters that will totally send this the the linux system into a uh, how does ping of death work i think this, uh, is that what you mean seb is how does that work um it's like an oversized packet um so you know kind of like this you know i set a variable and i say the variable expects it to be this long um like with the c code here with the 21 uh, bit or 21 digit um with ping for example all of those protocols are predefined and says hey uh, you know, these packets have this much length to work with, a header will be this long, and then you have this much room for data, all this good stuff. And all the protocols handle this differently, and some of them encapsulate within others, and just rather than reinventing the wheel, uh, you know, they'll just tack onto uh, the shoulder of giants there, right? Um, but with ping of death, that was the one that would send an, I believe it's called an oversized packet, to where it would interpret it right, and it would, it's a single packet denial of service. Um, again, mitigated. That's something that probably was seen and known for a long period of time beforehand too, that, you know, some individuals at organizations who did this, or, you know, static and dynamic malware analyses pro uh, processes and saw this kind of stuff happening, were able to prevent it before there was a, um, you know, on the market, over the counter prevention for it that came down through a vast or something, right? So, I mean, there is definitely benefit in learning this stuff and doing this stuff rather than just, work, you know, relying on uh, the community downstream stuff, right? Um, but anyway, right. So a lot of talk in there about the concepts here. And I believe that's a, that sounds very similar, Kevin. Yes. Um, so Kevin, if, if not, everybody sees this, um, uh, asking if it's similar, you know, the ping of death would be similar to the billion laughs attacks. Um, saying, you know, it, it uh, dosses itself by trying to process a massive data packet. It sounds exactly like the ping of death. Um, right. Ping, and thank you, Mark. Yeah. So Mark saying that the ping of death made a return in 2013, uh, around 2013 with IPv6. Perfect example. So IPv4, IPv6, like eventually everything's going to get updated. We're going to have a new version. You're going to have to make some kind of modification to the existing code base or go to a completely new one. And learning from the history, you're going to just keep repeating. You're going to have like the same problems because these are inherent to the way that we work, right? Um, and I'm, and I, sorry, I'm, I'm bouncing off chat here too. So, you know, for anybody who doesn't see John, uh, Apache is the world's largest open source foundation. Um, all his volunteers have heard, whether I pick Apache or any other. Yeah, no. And so, you know, sharing a little bit of, uh, you know, the kind of vulnerabilities that come through at like a general, um, you know, workflow, if anybody else is unfamiliar with that. Um, yeah, John, so when I was with the Coast Guard contracts, uh, or working my Coast Guard contract here in town, we did more um, vulnerability management than I did on a lot of my other jobs. Um, and of course, we were through Nessus, if nobody's familiar with that, that's the general DOD standard of vulnerability scanner. Um, but, um, right, generally speaking, Firefox and Apache get patched almost every week. Um, and if not a patch, you'll get a STIG which is something where, you know, I'm talking about rather than a patch, you're making just a configuration change, right? Um, and so these are all prevention and mitigation methods. I'm glad we're still talking about this to such an extent. I'm glad you all want to focus on that a lot, right? Um, because, you know, at the end of the day too, a little bit of uh, internal insight, there's not a lot of penetration testers in the field. Um, 
you know, there's not a huge red team presence in the US at least um, on corporate salary, to say the least. Um, you know, a lot of people will do bug bounties more independently. Um, but, you know, that could change in the future, right? I mean, the more we see that the same problems, you know, I've, there's easily five here in our chat this time that continuously just keep happening and keep happening. And right, education is one part of it. You know, the more you know about it, the more you can see, the more you can prevent, the more you can not accidentally step into. Um, you know, but, you know, just doing it, getting your hands in it, right? This is why I wanted to, I actually lost my links discussion. So I'll come back to uh, the earlier question about some of the resources, but um, right, like, this is why I want you to have the resources. I want you to have the zoo. I want you to get Wireshark and I want you to see how that works and see what the packets look like as they come through. So when you're doing a dynamic analysis at some point, when you didn't think you were gonna have to, um, you at least have a little bit of a ground to run on, right? Um, you know, with static analyses, um, definitely do some further research with Ghidra and do some, um, you know, even if not running it, look at the kind of strings that you would expect to pull out, right? And you can do this without Ghidra. Uh, you know, to pop back to the uh, integrated OS tools, you know, disassembly and extraction, Microsoft has a built-in command line that will extract strings from executables, um, assuming they're not packaged and encrypted. So that's where it's, you know, you know, the third party, middleware stuff as you know john's talking about again uh is going to be a little bit more well or fully voiced and robust in some ways than the os stuff uh, which is generally just more limited um but there's always like good takeaway from it um but right and so i'm not going to linger on any of my uh remaining actual slide topics because it looks like we have a lot of questions in discussion and i'm going to keep pushing you um I'm looking forward to answering that, Mark. Give me just a quick one. Um, so I'm gonna uh, also just thank you all for being there. This is my first presentation with Flatiron. I know this is a little bit of a short one, but I intended on talking to you a lot more than I intended on reading off of my slides. So I insist, please keep asking questions and I'll flip back to any of these pages if anybody has extenuating questions on any of the content, um, but I'm gonna stay here for now and I'm gonna start bouncing off of Mark and then we can go from there. Um, thank you, David, I really appreciate it. Um, so Ghidra and Ida Pro, um, very similar. So Ida Pro is, I wanna say the original thing, tool that everybody used before the NSA developed Ghidra based on that, those principles. Um, so Ida or IDA Pro, however you wanna say that. Um, oh, Malwarebytes is yelling at me, I hope you guys don't see that. Um, thank you, John. Right, and um, so state of receiving CH. So Mark's asking about my CH as well, and I wanna share this one. Um, you know, certifications always help, right? Uh, at least at a certain tier, you know, if I wanted to get into like a major corporation, a Fortune 50 company, DOD, something like that, they really are paper sharks a lot of ways. Um, you know, where other places might much, much, much prefer, um, uh, what, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading another chat. I'm getting distracted. Goodness, I have so much I want to talk about and everybody has so much more to say. Um, it, I, I think it's much more useful in smaller organizations to just have some ability and the ability, like, you know, I always say this in a kind of funny way. It, it don't under credit your, any of your paper, but the paper is really what gets you in the door in a lot of places. And then your true experience and your understanding of the content, which isn't always a testable thing, right? Um, your practical knowledge of a subject is what's really going to carry you through an interview and get you a job, I believe. Um, and I, I want to take a moment to, to, to tout Flatiron on that. Um, again, I'm not like a diehard for these guys. I'm not an old hat. Um, I'm relatively new to the company. I've been through a lot of organizations and a lot of educational organizations. Um, I went to four different colleges before I eventually landed where I went. Um, <clears throat> by far, this is one of the best educational experiences you can get. Um, you know, with university, you really do have a lot of paper, a lot of writing, a lot of, um, it, it, I feel like the bigger you get, the more you're, you're just, you're being pushed to just get a piece of paper and you're not getting a lot of the job experiences and most of the educational tracks that I've experienced. Um, here, a lot, for example, the way that I was, you know, just downloading the zoo and trying to, you know, <laughs> get it to work and just analyze a few pieces of malware, that's more or less exactly how you would be doing schoolwork here. 
um, in the labs, right? Um, so you're given pieces of code to analyze and tear apart. You're given lots of really good resources and that directly correlate to not paper knowledge and not ABCD, which tool does this? It correlates to, okay, I remember when I used this tool, I saw these things. I know that it does these things. I know this is how this workflow goes, right? Um, you know, and you could have answered a question on your test years ago about the, um, for example, the uh, cyber kill chain, which is a big part of the CEH. Um, you know, what phase of the attack are you on? Are you enumerating? Are you just gathering information about your host? Or have you, you already know what kind of server they're in? Or have you already infiltrated? And now you're just trying to, you know, uh, hold on to where you, you are and get some data exfiltration without getting detected, right? Um, Okay, and so I'm gonna move on to another question. I've, I've hit that one pretty hard, if that's okay. If you have any follow-up, please come and keep putting them in the chat. Um, so, uh, you know, Mark's asking uh, about how to create a cybersecurity portfolio. Um, that's a common question. So that's another thing I'm gonna to push to the Flatiron curriculum. I, the way that we schedule some, or set some stuff up, even papers that you write, I push people to really give it a good effort um, and have that, you know, five, you know, four or five subject paper um, that we write through our curriculum, which is one of the few papers you do have to write, you know, for all, you know, it isn't, you don't have to write a paper every class in here like you do in college. Um, a lot of, more of it is hands-on, so don't stress too much if anybody doesn't understand that one um, or doesn't know that one yet. Um, <laughs> John, you're funny. Uh, <laughs> um, but right, so cybersecurity portfolio is really, it, how do I say this? Cyber is an extremely wide field. And I've said it a few different ways in this discussion that uh, you know, security falls to everyone in a certain way. So your portfolio is gonna very much dis or be built around what you're doing in the field. Um, so if you are doing code analysis, your portfolio might be um, you know, a, a, a GitHub page that has like a, virtual, like a virtual snapshot that they can download and look at some stuff that you've done in like a contained environment or you might just give them a link or access, you know, however you want to do this. Um, screenshots aren't always the way to go, right? Um, which is probably why it's weird to create a portfolio for cyber. Um, but again, you know, just whatever you do, correlate any paper and anything that you have like that with something hands-on and field experience. Um, it Development-wise, like if you're a Python guy, show them projects, show them functional pieces. Um, those are great portfolio pieces for, for anyone, I believe. Um, not just cyber. I mean, like I said, you know, programming, if you're, uh, you know, if you're a systems guy and you had a project that was really cool, um, you know, even a network diagram of it, right? So if you set up a home lab that did a certain thing, or like, you know, you, you set up a centralized gaming server at home or something simple, simple like that, you know, I see simple, uh, non uh, commercial like that, um, that's still something that you'd very much want to document as, you know, much as possible um, and put in, put away, even if it's, just in a single page doc that you can reference every now and then just to remember what you've done. Um, you know, one I always go back to for myself was a deployment of the design and deployment of an IDS system at a health department here in North Carolina. Um, I used Security Onion, you know, we didn't have a budget. Um, I had never touched any of this before. I had a bachelor's, but of course I've never done any kind of IDS configuration because I wasn't put through those, those rings, right? Um, but yeah, I'm gonna say this again, you do get put through those here. Um, so I'm gonna try to grab another one here. Um, if, uh, to stress change control of policy. So yeah, John uh, thinks it's a good idea in future presentations to stress change control policies, processes, and procedures because IT cowboys can take a company down with their shortcuts. Yes. Um, I'll share a quick funny story about that, which um, yeah, I feel like is most of what you get from any instructor or professor. Um, outside of the curriculum, you get their experience and their stories, right? So I'm gonna push forward with all of my talking. I hope nobody's being bothered by this. You're very welcome, Mary. Um, if you're parting ways, it was great to have you here today. Um, you know, you know, I, hope I hope I see you in the future. Um, but uh, so, uh, right, so the change control policies. Uh, John, that's a great one. You know, I, I sat down to start working on this presentation and I realized like I was saying how wide the field is or just cyber in general is, I felt like there's so much content that I couldn't manage to fit in here, right? Um, you know, add on to that, you know, talking about the content and then me wanting to show you a screenshot or some kind of example of it, right? Um, 
So, I mean, it, at that point, I just got to a scope issue where I couldn't include enough, right? Um, but yes, change control is huge. Um, I mean, I, I want to even point out one of these principles in, uh, in analysis uh, that I feel like kind of goes to change control, which is just only changing one thing at a time, right? Um, so, you know, if, if you're analyzing something and you're, you can't quite figure it out, you don't want to go making changes all willy-nilly and then recompile it and then figure out what that area, you change one thing at a time, right? You do a single act at a time, see how that changes, and then you go on from there. Um, yeah, but to where that's to change control, just not having things change overnight, not having patches applied that weren't approved, not having, uh, I mean, really any lack of visibility or transparency or understanding of your network is becoming an issue, right? Um, but, you know, that goes into documentation and management frameworks and all that stuff. So, um, so I think we are getting a little drifted there, but. Um, so does Flatiron offer specialized degrees for people who have been in the industry for a while? Um, so not degrees. Um, so I, and I actually, I, I, I could follow up with you on this. I, I don't know the, uh, like the, uh, verbiage or anything that goes along with our certificates and like what you earn or, or your diploma. I don't, I don't want to put any wrong words in anybody's mouth because, um, I, I'm not 100% sure on all that, but I will say um, in the four disciplines that we do have with data science, um, cybersecurity, software engineering, and the fourth one, product design. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> oh, excuse me, that's my alarm. Um, our product design, um, you know, we do have. I feel like you always learn, uh, for, for one, definitely more than you're going to do in any individual job. Um, and also, um, we, we have external resources that we really try to push, right? Um, you know, most of what Flatter and I feel is about um, isn't necessarily the paper or like the extenuating degrees or certifications. It's really about um, the, the on the job experience, right? Um, so getting your hands into the systems before you actually get into a, um, a, a an enterprise in uh, an enterprise environment, right? Um, and also with the external resources, uh, O'Reilly is a really cool one that we have now. Um, that's relatively new, and I just saw a few students start to see. Um, I'm gonna call somebody out if he's still in here. Jerry can always uh, give you a good word of advice on that because he was the first one to find that and relate it to me that students can get access to these uh, O'Reilly titles. Um, so there's just like a good online library and they have things like AWS, CISSP, uh, you know, CEH, uh, all kinds of programming and development books, things on Rust. Um, so, you know, and again, I'm going to talk about a slide I deleted because I didn't quite get it polished the way I wanted to. Um, you know, at, at Flatiron here, we have a big statement and it is, uh, you know, be a lifelong learner. Um, so, you know, whether it is in the field or like directly in your line of work or something that's going to give you a foot up on, you know, uh, you know, lateral mobility within an organization, um, you know, the more you can know, the, the more prepared you're going to be. Um, uh, yeah, I understand scope creep, uh, can you discuss tips like a networking, not allowing PCs to gain access without being patched, uh, USB port lockdown, standardization of app configuration by department. Okay, so, you know, standardization, I'm going to lean a little away from just because that could be super software based, um, and like management framework based, again, like I was saying, like, if we're doing uh, Microsoft SCCM and dealing with that tool, um, we'll drift a little bit too much outside of, uh, I guess, like the analysis of malware, but it um, some of this is good stuff, I think. Um, so like isolating things on your network that don't meet certain standards. Um, hmm. I forget the actual platforms that can do this. Um, the easiest one would be like a hardware-based security system, right? So um, is it very cool stuff in trying to find ways to study for some certifications? Okay, and there's Jerry. I hope everybody can see that. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that too. Um, so USB port lockdowns, that's one too. Um, so, I mean, that's just a policy you can push out, right? Uh, I'd say the best thing that Microsoft has ever done for the world is Active Directory. Um, so, and, you know, uh, group policy, just being able to manage these like roles. Um, <clears throat> that's now system group policy. That's really cool, Mark. I'll relay that as well. Um, so, you know, but not just to USB port lockdowns. What about, um, you know, network technicians? What about, uh, you know, 
uh, IPv or IP port lockdowns, right? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm out of water. Goodness. Um, uh, PCs can actually use port lock standardization of app configuration. You know, and we're, that's some change control stuff too, John. So, um, you know, if we're talking about standardization of apps um, and configuration, uh, I mentioned STIGs as well. So, some of you who ha have a DoD experience are going to know a little bit about this. Um, rather than that being passed down through like a, a change management system like SCCM, where you know Microsoft is going to push out specific patches or hold back other ones that you, and you can configure them from there. Um, with this interface, uh, right, so certain IP ports open by default by the OS and one server should always be closed. Yeah, and that's, you know, rules, you know, I say dogma doesn't get you in here, but that's some of the rules that you should really go on, right? Um, we've kind of pushed in um, industry for a while to have, you know, like firewalls, for example, default closed, like don't let them do anything. And then switches on the other hand to default open, you know, just let everybody on switch talk to everybody, but if you hit the firewall, just assume you can't unless we say you can. Uh, thank you, David. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, you sticking around and happy to talk to you. I hope I helped you out. Um, now everybody see a uh, farewell, David. Bye, David. Everybody can give him a wave. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I, there's a lot of content here. I'm just trying to make sure I touch everybody's points. Um, okay. Yep, okay. And so, yeah, and a lot of the stuff that we're talking about now is that defense, right? It's the, it's the prevention. Um, so, you know, some of that's going to be blatantly blocking ports and some of it, it, it let's talk back all the way to a very very basic principle of security and that's the cia triad uh so confidentiality integrity and availability those are the three tenants that we really need to look for in everything we do in security and two of those make plenty of sense to security people right and that's confidentiality and integrity uh you want your content to be confidential right so um you know a lot of this malware is trying to decrypt stuff that's encrypted. It's trying to exfiltrate data that you want to be private and put it somewhere that they can see it and access it whenever they want to, right? And so, I mean, obviously, security all goes hand in hand, just to kind of tie this around to where it references malware. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, sometimes we have to open up holes that we don't want to open. And that's where the availability comes in. Because, you know, security is only good up to a certain point. Like, I don't want people to see these files. I don't want this to have access. But then if I can't access it, what good is it? You know, why is the data even there at all? And that's where availability comes in. So, you know, we're going to do access controls that say, you know, I personally don't want anybody from uh, like a certain country to access this website. Then you can do country code blocking through the firewall. You could do it through a website or a web filter. Um, you could do a proxy server. There's all kinds of different ways to do it and methods. Um, the protection besides firewalls would be host based and network intrusion sexism. Yeah, right. So, and I actually started talking about a, a intrusion detection system a little while ago um, when I did security security onion. Um, that's a good one, right? So, how, how do you know it's going on? You know, network visibility, uh, seeing everything that goes in either direction across the network is extremely important for anybody. I mean, think about your bank account, right? So, if you didn't know what money was coming in and what money was going out of your bank account, it would just be kind of ridiculous, right? That's not even something that you can think of. Um, but why was that any different for something like a multi-million dollar corporation? If you don't, if you don't have full visibility of all the stuff that comes across your network and you don't have the systems in place that are like an IDS or an IPS, which an I, IPS would be intrusion prevention, which more or less could just function as like a firewall, but IDS, uh, detection system, you know, they're not stopping anything. They're telling you, Hey, I see something you should look at it. And that's an easy way to tip right off into these static and dynamic analysis sections, um, so I have off topic, but any possibility of another exploit demo? We'd love to see how to use an after free, uh, use after free to RC. So, yeah, that's a good point too, John. Um, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll dog back to that too. So I have one, uh, that you don't see right above you there. Um, I, I don't have any good resources to do another like demonstration or anything right now. Um, you know, I, I wish I could think of a, a good re, uh, resource right off the top of my head to just send you. Um, but, you know, for lack of a, or how else could how it might happen?
<laughs> so, okay, I would love to see an exploit uh, use after free to RCE. You know, I gotta be honest with you, Kevin, I'm not totally sure what a use after free uh, statement here is. If you wanna clarify that to me, I'll, I'll try to tackle that for you. Um, and, why, and while you're working on that, if anybody didn't see some of the stuff about O'Reilly that I mentioned, um, yeah, they have uh, certification paths uh, that you know lead right to specific certifications or specific uh, uh, areas in the, of the industry. Um, so that's helpful too. And they kind of have like a pre uh, uh, curated you know list of content for you to look through. There's actual video courses and stuff available too, not just the books. Um, so yeah, but I mean that's that's all stuff that's open to you at Flatiron, um, just as a continuation of that. And um, so Kevin, and, and yeah, right. So I'll, I'll I, I'm kind of out of stuff, and just, I honestly think we're we're starting to get to a, a a good stopping point, and we can just you know keep talking about a few of these last things. Um, but yeah, will there three five station uh, will this presentation be available for everyone? I think so. Um, it could, I think it's going to be a few days um, because there's a. Um, from memory the attack and take it over experts. That's interesting, Kevin. I'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, uh, presentation, uh, yeah, within the next three days. Thank you so much, Corey. Um, okay, so Kevin, yeah, after a variable is released from memory, the attacker can take it over to execute and uh, uh, remote code execution, which is RCE. In some cases, if, uh, essentially it's hijacking variables after they're freed from memory. Um, I'm not 100% familiar with that. So I do know, you know, this almost a little bit like memory leak uh, content. SC Richards, thank you. I really appreciate it. Again, I hope I helped you out. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep up with you here, Kevin. Um, right, so the remote code execution. And as that, so, you know, that's remote control, you know, remote access Trojan, remote, ex, remote code execution. That's somebody else controlling your machine remotely for those who don't understand that. Um, so those areas in your variables, and this is actually, this, there's another cool information, a piece of information I would like to even possibly pull up before I let everybody go and I can show you, Kevin. Um, so C code, and that's what we did this through with the buffer overflow. Um, it, it, the buffer overflow issue is inherent in C, and that's why it's so easy to do. And it's because of the way it handles the variables and passes the information around. And so a lot of you know newer languages don't have the same um, concerns or like you know wouldn't be uh, vulnerable in the same ways or by the same actions, um, but still use some of the same vectors if that makes sense right so you know when i you know i am saying you know the pointer says hey look here to find the other uh memory location some exploits you know when i was talking about buffer overflow some exploits instead of saying look here and it tells it like go to another location what it'll do is actually rewrite that pointer instead of pointing it somewhere else just continue reading uh lines of code and like executing uh really code that's not even being processed in the same way um, like it's not going through the same security checks. It's like, okay, security check on this. And now we're going to look at our pointer. Oh, that's actually a vulnerability or, or a malware. And then it runs, right? So it's really about tricking the system into making it be in parts of memory that'll make it run without you having to actually run it, right? So, and that's that's getting very high level. That's starting to get real technical. Um, and so I hope I touched on at least enough for you to, Oh, so effectively you need to do same point and place memory over here will be released. Right. And so memory addresses is where that comes into. Um, and I might actually let me see here. And so I, I, I can't look all through it right now, but we do have some in that buff in some of our coursework here. Um, we in that buffer overflow assignment actually. So we go through and show you, you know. And where I showed you the code and I'm showing it goes over to line and, you know, mod use the pointer to find the other variable. Um, what we do in the lab by modifying the code slightly is actually get it to spit out the memory address that's given us the error. 
So that's the mitigation that we've talked about a couple of times, right? So it might give us a seg fault. It might crash if we overflow our buffers, but it's not going to let somebody do something that they weren't otherwise supposed to do, right? So that's the mitigation. And that's, you know, kind of like I was talking about with availability. We still have to let people execute code. We still have to let people define things. We still have to let people do so much of what is doing that's making it vulnerable, but we just have to stop this one bad action, right? Um, so, right, uh, missed that part of the demo. Oh, I'm sorry, man. Um, I can, I don't actually, I think I might've closed it. I'm super sorry. Oh no, I have it up here. Did you see any of this C stuff here, Kevin? Oh, good point. You know what? That's a good point. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Then, uh, hopefully in the next couple of days, you can at least look back. Um, um, are you a current student? Or are you an uh, aspiring student? I'll give you time there. Um, but okay, um, so I'm gonna minimize this and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna scroll back. I thought I saw a couple more questions. I'm gonna try to keep moving along a little bit. We're getting close on time. Um, good news, there's a lot of changes, but the defense concepts and fundamentals will always remain the same. Right, John. So defense is kind of always the same, right? And I feel like attacks are always almost the same. So, you know, we say that, you know, they do change, they do constantly change as far as how they get to us. But the way that they, like, that's kind of what I was getting at there. The way that they actually leverage and take advantage of the system is very similar, right? Like buffer overflows are very common. SQL injection is very common. Um, that's really cool, Kevin. I'm super happy to see that. Um, yeah, I mean, we work a lot with, we, we do Metasploit, we do some payload actual, uh, uh, you know, uh, authentication bypass, we do a uh, payload to a Windows VBS script, we, a lot of cool stuff. Um, not super, like, again, penetration tester depth in all of it. Um, if you, you know, it's not required at least, um, but we still also give you the resources to start going down those roads. Um, and even the places to submit those assignments and have us review those for you. Um, so again, the curriculum is pretty wide and it's also, you know, geared towards someone who's never touched it before, but also has enough depth and content that someone like yourself who's actively doing this in the field can still come and get good wider and filling information out of it. Um, CISSP level. So it's weird. Uh, yes and no. Uh, I mean, the CISSP is super specific. It has its eight domains and everything. Um, I would say that easily across the board, if you come out of our, our uh, program, there's no reason I believe that you wouldn't be ready to just like do a quick study and take a security plus. And then over that, I would say you're even a little ready to be a junior Python dev. You would be totally postured to be a um, CISSP candidate um, with the caveat that you might need to study some of the legislature a little bit more. Um, but of course, we don't, we, we don't advocate or, you know, um, say that we're preparing anyone for certification exams. Um, again, this is like our, our curriculum where we're trying to get people more or less in, into jobs um, and fill the field out because really uh, I can look back to the CDR cyber defense report and the number one record or across all countries, all industries and everything, the number one issue from like organizations and hiring managers is that they can't find enough good people. Um, are you saying 99 percent john that's cool i'll wait on that too so um and I hope, just once i'm make sure i didn't miss anybody i feel like i've skipped a few people um and richard robinson uh i believe yes yes i, I there should be a link going out i don't know if that goes to emails Corey, if you could confirm that for me um, how they access this after, I'd really appreciate that. Um, yeah, sad truth is 99% of attacks are social engineering and ransomware attacks on non-technical employees. Right, and perfect, there we go. All the recordings will be sent, or linked to the recording at very least will be sent to the email addresses that you registered for your seminar with. Uh, thank you so much, Corey. Um, Okay, and but yeah, CISSP level I easily because I've studied for CISSP. I have the gold all in one book right here in front of me. Um, 
I haven't taken the exam because I haven't wanted to spend the $800 to be totally honest. Um, and I don't feel like it's going to get me too much further in the industry. Um, you know, I do have some good paper under me, um, got a lot of experience. So, you know, for me, I don't feel like it's the next step, but I do have a lot of knowledge on it, thankfully. And I have a sponsor waiting if I ever do want to spend it. Um, but, uh, right. So the, so much of the CISSP, I would argue is very much managerial. It is not as much practitioner based. It's not the guys who are going to be doing penetration testing. It's not the guys who are going to be doing this kind of malware analysis. Definitely not commonly, but they you know, might have the ability to, or you know, know the tools. Which is you know what I want to ex uh, expose you all to is what is available and what you can start practicing with, right? Um, but um, good resources study for CDH. Um, I'll bounce that off of you too, Kevin, and I can help you out with that. Um, right, and so to bounce off one more right here, what John was saying with, you know, the, the majority of attacks coming through just untrained people. Yeah, I mean, social engineering, I, I want to say there's a huge percentage. Right, I've had a, I had a slide with all of the links, and I might need to remake it because I think I accidentally deleted it. So, like, I mean, I had links to the, uh, to Ghidra, I had the link to um, the zoo had a link to Rimnux, which is the alternate to Ghidra that runs on Linux natively. Um, so there's just like a bunch of more or less just all the web links that you go to to download these tools to start doing this stuff. VirtualBox as well. Um, um, Mark, that is not to everyone. If you uh, want to resend that, uh, you just change your little Dropbox from your two section and put it to everyone or put it to Kevin directly if you'd like. Um, but, and, and so I'll, I'll come off of that as well too. Um, CEH, uh, for what it's worth, um, I think the biggest part of your study should be using and practicing on the tools. I want to say there's probably 50 to hundred tools that it mentions in there. Um, a lot of them do a lot of the same stuff, very, very minorly different or display it in a little bit different of a way. So there's a ton of nuance. Um, I, I would argue that the version 10 was not very good. So you should absolutely take the version 11. Um, I might be wrong, it might be nine to 10, but whatever the most recent one is, please take that one. Um, the pass rates for either the nine or the 10, whichever one was preceding, uh, dropped extremely low, below 20%. Um, and to the point where um, they had to change their study content and their test to actually properly reflect yeah, uh, the, the, long story short, their study material did not show the answers to the questions. It just, it was that simple. Um, and I read, a, I read a big study on it um, for some of the schools that buy vouchers directly from CEH and do things uh, with them and are some of the bigger voucher buyers were the ones who flagged this and like posted about it. Um, so again, definitely, uh, I mean, focus on tools and, you know, actually using them so you can like uh, try to remember some of the flags and syntax to some of them just very vaguely, at least even just, you know, top 10%, just get your hands on it and playing with it for a few. Um, but right. Uh, that's probably the main thing that I would say to help you with the CEH uh, for what that's worth. Thanks, John. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. And I, I just I, honestly, at the end of the day, I love talking about this stuff. I love helping people. Every time I learn something, the first thing I want to do is tell everybody else about it, right? So, um, you know, hopefully, at least a few of you, if you if you were considering it, uh, you know, joining us and trying to be a part of Flatiron, you know, I pushed in the right direction. Um, I'm going to probably have to modify this slide to add the resources. I've seen you asked ask about it a couple of times. Um, after the after the presentation here, and then whenever these get uploaded, I can maybe work with Corey about sending the slides along, um, and we'll we'll see about getting getting them to you that way. Um, um, right, and so uh, also John, uh, you're talking about you know, just a lot of good industry resources and like, like you know reading thought leaders, right? You know paying attention to the people who are on the front lines, and that's you know ex please please continue to do that, right? Um, when I mentioned this uh, cyber defense report, and again, for those uh, who haven't looked back to it, um, 
that is from ISC squared. I'm trying to find my page. Here we go. Uh, that's from ISC squared, which is the CISSP uh, authority. This one here, the cyber defense report. And so this is a little bit more of that whole wide spectrum, international, um, you know, perspective through surveys of the people who are actually experiencing cyber hack or attacks and threats. Um, there's a lot of good just industry information, like the way the industry is going, um, increases in certain things, increases of country attacks, all, all kinds of good information in here. And if you're anyone is going to be in cyber, you should at least read, you know, a relevant section of this uh, when it gets released annually or biannually, um, and along with other reports. You know, they're not the only one who do these reports. There's all kinds, you know, uh, you know, people who make these firewalls, Veronix, for example, um, they do their own reports. And generally speaking, a lot of them correlate. Uh, you know, you might see some minor variations in data. Um, I'm not a data science guy, but I'm sure there's explanation with margin of error and all that stuff to that. Um, but again, great resource. And I'll add this into the links as well uh, going forward. Um, and I'm going to look back to this now. I have another chat. Uh, Uh, how does Flatiron compare to other schools? Um, so, yeah, that's, I love Flatiron. Uh, I mean, I couldn't tell you enough that I, I like my job and I actually like the, the stuff I teach. Um, if someone's enjoying it, where are the fees listed? I don't know about the fees. Um, Corey, uh, do you know anything about the, where they would find the pricing for the uh, curriculum and or any of that stuff? and link to admissions. Thank you so much. Um, there, so we'll have a link in coming now um, for that one. Um, um, I, I can't say anything about like the funding uh, with that. I do know that we have a lot of uh, funding uh, partnerships with like the VA um, and other organizations, but I don't know specifically about that one. Um, but, uh, you know, whatever you need to do to get in touch with like, a, uh, like an admissions person, Right, uh, for our info session, we have one third. Beautiful, thank you so much, Corey. This has been so helpful. Um, thank you, T. Carnes. Um, I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Um, hey, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling back. I'm making sure I'm not missing anybody here. So, please get your analyze. Um, so Kev is asking about tips to keep yourself safe and separated when you're doing these malware analysis. Um, I did skip over that one. Sorry about that one. Um, so <sighs> virtualization and containerization are probably both justifiable in this. I don't usually say containerization for anyone uh, other than uh, for version controls. For example, I mentioned the Java development kit. So if you need a different version of Java to run Ghidra, for example, you would probably still want to run Docker and put that way you can have like a different version of Java or like a different version of Apache or whatever inside this Docker instance, which is inside your virtualized host on VirtualBox, which is inside your PC. Your PC, your uh, one more level of segmentation that I want to mention is your network. Um, so when you're configuring VirtualBox, um, a good tip that I would say is to make sure that you don't use like your local IP network. Um, you would want to use a different NAT network. Um, so for example, if your local stuff is uh, 192.168.0. whatever, you would generally want your secondary network to have a different subnet. That way, even if something does try to pop out through the network, it has to route and it's not able to. Um, so um, that's my main tip there. Um, and I, I believe that was you that asked that, Kevin. I'm, I'm sorry, that's pretty far up here now. I'm getting a lot of, of feedback. Um, right, 10.0, or I see a lot of 10. Dot, yeah, 10.0.2 is pretty common one. 10.0.10, I think, is another one that VirtualBox likes to automatically set up. Um, but right, so that's generally what the NAT network would set up. And it, I mean, you could use 172. Any private range is fine. Um, just make sure it's not, uh, you could even use 192.168. dot, or no, I guess that's subnetting, so it still could go between. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to use a whole different subnet, like the whole different class, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, like 10.0.0. something, uh, perfect example of using it rather than, unless, again, your home might be using that. If that's the case, switch over to 192 or 172. Um, so you can just share clipboard risk. I mean, shared with who? 
or you just mean like across post me uh, yes i wouldn't do that i also choose not to um you know, like in virtual box, there's a really easy way to set up like transient folders. I try not to do that either. When I do want something on a VM that I need that I, you know, would give it from my host, I just show, I just set up an SSH connection. Um, and, and I keep files alone on my main computer. And then it's really just a matter of generally starting the service, usually with Ubuntu or Fedora. Um, every now and then you might have to install a package depending on your flavor. Um, but yeah, so I got two minutes. I think I have to stop talking. I hope I touched on everything. Um, yeah, two minutes here. Corey, do we? Um... You did great. This was awesome. Everybody was really engaged. Oh, goodness. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good observation. I hope you guys did enjoy this. I'm very glad to see so many people are still here. Um, obviously, I was extremely nervous about presenting to all you lovely people. And this lovely job that I appreciate being in and appreciate being a part of. Um, but it looks like I might have had a successful day, and I hope you all did too. Um, and thank you, thank all of you. Why didn't this admin like your password? I thought for sure. I I love you, Kevin. That's what I'm going to say to that. I love you, <laughs> and I appreciate you being here and keeping this so lively today. Um, Ibrahim, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone. Um, I'm very happy to see that this is all going out and that everybody appreciated this for what it was. Um, and I really hope that I see some of you in the curriculum moving forward. Um, you know, even if I don't end up your direct instructor, if that is the case, you will absolutely see me on Wednesdays at our session, our lab help session, and or just random days that I'm in the channels helping you out. So um, yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out to whoever your contact is, whether you're internal or external, um, to try to get the resources you need. Uh, this afternoon, I'll be remaking my last slide with the uh, uh, gathered resources and links and references, um, and that will be sent out with the video. Um, heck yeah, John, that's what I like to hear. This, that's your, thank you. Thank you, that makes me feel really good. Ian, do you want to share your LinkedIn or your? Uh, I appreciate everyone. And uh, I don't know if you need to make some closing remarks or if we're going to close out here today, but I'll stand back and mute myself. And uh, thank you again, everybody, for being here. I'm going to go ahead and stop my share.